Welcome to episode 23 of Wands World. You will, I hope, remember that we've been talking about opposites and we've been talking about opposition. Well, now I want to talk about a specific kind of opposition, competition. And uh, if you've been following me, you remember that when I was a young boy in South Australia in the 1950s, there used to be occasionally newsreels on um, the cinema or on television about competition and they'd show a picture of a foot race between young boys and they'd be running, 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 running and the, the commentator in his voiceover would say competition is good for us all, it makes us all better. Well, that's an interesting sentiment and that's exactly what I want to explore. Does competition make us better. There are a lot of areas where this has been discussed, politics, biology, school, Olympics. All right, let's unpack competition. Now, we started with the foot race, so let me consider a very important foot race. Consider the foot race of Sir Roger Bannister in a foot race at Ifley Stadium where he broke the four minute mile. Very, very significant event in sports history. The four minute mile was broken at the Ifley track of Oxford University on May 6th, 1954 in a race between the British AAA, that's the Amateur Athletic Association, and Oxford University, three men for each team. Bannister was on the AAA team and he had with him Christopher Chataway and Chris Brasher. And I have no idea, can't remember who the Oxford University team was. So here we have a race that is for the world record and for a world-class time under four minutes, still a pretty fair time. I, I could never do it because that's four times around a 440 yard track with less than a minute round each time. Well, when I was a young sprinter, I could go round one time in one minute. I could not go round four times in less than one minute per lap. Now that's incredible. And here's the point. It was not a competition. The AAA team was theoretically competing with the Oxford University team, but the Oxford University team were just left in the dust. The AAA team just took off and kept going and were, no, I was going to say miles ahead, <laughs> it's a mile race, but they were streets ahead of them from the start. The way that Bannister was able to get under four minutes for the mile was by cooperation. He had Christopher Brasher pace him for the first two laps, Christopher Chataway for the third and part of the fourth lap and then he broke away on his own. So he needed pacers, that is he needed people who could run very fast and keep him up to speed so he knew what pace he had to run at, but they were not competing with him, they were cooperating with him, they were helping him. You can think of the same thing happening in uh, bicycle racing, uh, in the Tour de France, for example, we have teams. You have, there you do have 
actual genuine competition, but the teams are cooperating to help the lead runner get faster. So the notion that competition by itself leads to getting better at something just doesn't on the surface hold water. It may in some circumstances. It's certainly true that if you run a race versus just running without anyone in the race with you, you're probably going to run a lot slower. You, you push yourself harder when you're running with somebody else. But whether that person is competing or cooperating, in a certain sense, does not matter. So that's my point number one, is that competition by itself does not inherently lead to getting better. Cooperation can do the same. So that leads to my big point of all, which has to do with competition versus cooperation in biological evolution. Now right from the start, from the 19th century, from the, from the 1850s when Darwin proposed natural selection as the mechanism by which species evolved, people started thinking, ah, well when members of a species are in competition, then the fittest or the best or the strongest, or they call them a lot of different things, when they're in competition, the strongest win out. So therefore, in life, humans need to compete because it will make the strongest survive and the weakest won't survive. Well, that's also dreadfully simplistic for a lot of reasons. So from prehistory, I can give you two fairly straightforward examples to show where cooperation in evolution is better than competition. And um, I'll just point in the direction of social species like bees and ants for future reference as they survive because they cooperate, not because they compete. But let's look at two things. Let's look at hunting prehistorically and childbirth. In both cases, prehistorically, cooperation had to have been the norm, although there could have been exceptions. But when we look at modern hunting and gathering societies, what we find overwhelmingly is that when they go out hunting and they come back from the hunt, they share what they have produced. And the reason they share is because hunting is an uncertain occupation. And there are going to be times when even the best hunter comes back with nothing. And there are going to be, of course, a lot of times when the worst hunters come back with nothing too. But everyone comes back with nothing once in a while. And the best strategy under that circumstance that causes the strongest likelihood of survival is to bring the game home from the hunt and to share it around with the hunting band so that everybody gets something. You can think of this uh, obviously as a form of socialism, right? That everyone does their best, but then at the end of the day, everything is shared out. Now, I don't think that even in the uh, best hunting societies, everybody gets exactly equal proportions that the best hunter is usually going to get the best portion but everyone's going to get something that the whole band needs to survive in order for the best hunter to survive people can't survive on their own they need a band to live in and so they've got to have people to help them and let's also take childbirth. Now, if you've ever experienced childbirth, I haven't experienced it personally, obviously. I'm a man, but I have watched my son born, and I'm also um, a trained paramedic, so I've certainly seen plenty of childbirth. And you'll certainly know that it is painful, and that it's a terribly uncomfortable situation for the woman giving birth in all kinds of ways. But 
What we know, both clinically and culturally, is that women do a lot better in childbirth if they have people assisting them, not necessarily medically assisting them. I mean, that's true now in the modern world where you have childbirth in hospitals. But just having women there, just encouraging, supporting, like, yeah, you're doing okay, you're doing great, just a little more, you know, just encouraging, cooperating makes uh, childbirth easier and uh, reduces infant mortality. That's just a scientific or cultural fact uh, that even without modern medicine, cooperation during childbirth among, usually among women, is beneficial. Now you could be competitive, right? You could say, well, uh, I've had my five kids, I had them by myself, no problem, so you have yours by yourself. And that would be the end of the human race, <laughs> very simply, because not enough humans would survive. By cooperating, by living in communities, uh, prehistorically living in hunting bands, and then later in villages and so on. By living cooperatively, by living in a society and working together, we have survived as a species. So my obvious point that I keep drumming in already is that cooperation can be as much of a reason for success as competition. Well, uh, yesterday when I was recording, I was competing <laughs> with the builders and you undoubtedly heard them in the background. So I'm starting very early this morning to try to finish my session with less competition. <laughs> and this is definitely bad competition. So I'm going to ask a perilous question of you. Is cooperation better than competition or vice versa? <laughs> and of course it's kind of a stupid rhetorical question. But it gets to the heart of the matter when it comes to things like social relations and politics. There are some people who believe that we should all stand on our own two feet, pull ourselves up by the bootstraps or whatever cliche you want, and that we should do everything by ourselves. And that in a sense we are competing with everybody else and that we sh shouldn't cooperate, that that's bad for us and it's bad for other people too, that they should stand on their own two feet as well. My PhD fieldwork was done in uh, the Tidewater of North Carolina, in a town I called Tidewater in my publications. And there the people all believed that you should buy things that you had saved for and if you didn't have the money then you shouldn't buy them. You should work hard to get the money you needed to uh, buy the things that you wanted and until you had the money you shouldn't borrow or other ways find to get things that you wanted. Uh, they were very much sort of rugged individualists and I, I understand that. I also understand um, the possibility of sharing with other people, of cooperating with other people. Uh, happens to be what I believe in. If I've got money, I give it to people who need it. If I don't have it, I don't give it to them. It's as simple as that. And so, but uh, let me go back to my original question. Do you value competition or do you value cooperation? And this lies at the heart of our political system which again I'm going to be very simplistic about and say that there are two sides. You can be on the competitive side, which tends to be the right wing, or you can be on the cooperative side, which tends to be the left wing. Now I'm being simplistic, obviously there's a lot of complexities in here. I'm just trying to break things down like a good scientist to the simplest terms possible. So the people who are on the right wing say, like my um, people in Tidewater, we should all work hard by ourselves, we should compete with each other, work hard to produce what we need, and if we don't have it to spend, then we shouldn't try to get things. 
And we shouldn't help other people. We should let them work for their own things by themselves. Well, then there's the other side that says, well, everybody needs help. And if we all help one another, we'll all benefit. And the right wing is going to say, that's no good because if everybody has a safety net, they won't work hard enough. That competition is what encourages people to work hard. That if you know that you are secure, then you just sit back and you won't do anything. Well, just personally I know that's not true. I've got plenty of money. I don't need to work. I don't need to make this video. I don't need to do my blogs. I don't need to write books. I don't need to do anything. I can pay my bills. I've got no debts. I could just sit around and do nothing, but I don't want to. I want to produce videos. I want to write. I want to do things. It makes me happy. And so I'm only one individual. That's just an anecdote. But the point I'm trying to make is that you can't say universally that people will not work hard if they're not given incentives. Some people will work hard without incentives. Some people won't work hard even if they're given incentives. It's not a simple rule. But what I do know is that there is no argument here. There's no way for me to convince a person who thinks that competition is the best way to run a society. There's no way for me to convince that person that I know a better way. And there's actually probably not much of a way that you can convince me. You mean you could try, but we're pretty set in our ways. I'm pretty, you know, cooperative socialist kind of oriented, and that's it. So the one thing I will say is that political arguments are pointless. It's pointless here, it's pointless in threads on the internet, pointless in social media, pointless in endless discussions on cable news and on um, uh, webcasts and all those kinds of, just complete waste of time. And it's a waste of time watching them because they're just either reinforcing the, something you believe in or um, the opposite. Waste of time. Let me just though give you a few examples of where cooperation works in our society and then talk about how that operates even within a competitive society. And I'm going to look at the burning of the Houses of Parliament in England in 1834, because that fire happened yesterday, October 16th in the year 1834. Let's look at fires in the 19th century and how people insured against fire. So in the 19th century in England, there were no fire brigades, there were no municipal fire companies that went and put out fires when they happened, as is true nowadays in England and in the United States. Uh, back then, if you owned property, uh, you could either just run the risk of fire and pay nothing, or you could pay a fire insurance company uh, a, an annual fee and you would put a medallion on the building and then if the building did catch fire you could uh, raise the fire company who had a fire engine <laughs> horse drawn with a pump would come and put the fire out uh, but they would only put the fire out if you had the medallion on your building. So that was fire insurance. And that was how you protected property. Well, in 1834, the Houses of Parliament in London, in Westminster, caught fire. And the Houses of Parliament and the uh, houses all around the area, which were not uh, very rich uh, houses, um, were not insured. <laughs> and so it was only by the goodness of their hearts that one of the uh, insurance companies sent um, fire engines to help 
didn't really do much good. Most of the Houses of Parliament burnt down. They did do some good, though, um, and they, uh, they saved a few of the buildings which are still around today. So here's my question for you. Would you like to live in a society where you had to buy fire insurance to protect your house against fire? Or would you rather live in a society where you pay taxes and the taxes pay for a fire department so that your house is protected all year round? And you don't have to worry about making sure you have paid your fire insurance bill this month or this year. It's taken care of. Now there's some people who are going to say, well, I don't like that. I have to pay taxes for all kinds of things and I will take the risk. I don't think my house is going to burn down and I would rather save the money and use it for other things than pay it in taxes and have the government tell me that I have to have fire insurance a uh, fire department because everyone has to. It's, that's just not something I'm happy about. Some people say that. So that's my specific question has to do with fire. But then I have some more general questions about these social amenities. Would you rather live in a society where only the rich have an education and everybody else has little or no education? Or would you rather live in a society where everybody has the possibility of an education? Well, I can tell you that I'd rather live in the latter. I'd rather live in a society where everybody is educated and everybody has the ability to have the education that they want because I believe that the whole society will be a happier, more prosperous society and that's the kind of society I want to live in. So I want to live in a cooperative society but obviously there are some people who are quite happy with a competitive society with a dog-eat-dog -dog one like I'm okay, my children are okay, I've got a good house uh, my children have a good education, I've paid for medical insurance, I've paid for fire insurance, so I am okay and I don't care about anybody else. Or do you want to <laughs> do you want to have a society where everybody cooperates and everybody appreciates the value of other people? Alright, well as I said, there's no real answer to that question. It's a rhetorical question, but it's one that I have my answers to. And <laughs> I could have a comment list below and I could say, what do you think? But you probably realize if you're a viewer of any length of time here that I don't have a comment section because I'm not interested in people trolling me and saying, oh, you're an idiot, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know you're a socialist, you're, you believe in this, this, this. I don't want to hear it. Uh, I, on my other blog, I wrote a post once about the Second Amendment in the United States and how I thought it was a bad idea. And I had one person write, who was very nice about it. I really, you know, he was saying, no, I want my guns and, um, I don't agree with you, but it's your blog, so your rules. And that's fine. And if I could rely on people here to say my video log, my <laughs> rules, then I would have a comment section. But I don't because I treat this more like um, a television show, let's say, or um, uh, some public medium where I'm giving my statements about what I believe and you're free to believe what you want but I'm not interested in competition. I'm not interested in you challenging me and I don't want to challenge you. I'm stating my opinions and I'm also st strongly stressing that comp competition debate doesn't work because at bedrock 
we've got these foundational principles. Competition, cooperation. And that's it. We, we're set in our ways. And I, I freely acknowledge that I'm set in my ways based on experience and also based on temperament, on what I like. It makes me happy to help other people. It makes me happy to see other people happy. But I know there's a lot of people who are not happy when other people are happy. It's just the opposite. They want to be happy because other people are miserable. Uh, what we call a zero-sum game. My happiness comes at the expense of other people. Well, I don't believe that. I don't feel that. My happiness comes because other people are happy because I live in a happy world. That's my temperament. Now, to conclude, I will say that I'm not arguing that all competition is bad and all cooperation is good or the other way around. I'm not uh, I'm not saying that it's either or. This is not a binary opposition. That we can have both. There are areas where cooperation is the best and areas where competition is the best. Our task is to figure out in our culture or in our lives where cooperation works best for us and where competition works best for us so that there is some kind of compromise or middle ground rather than a binary opposition. So for the moment I'm going to end my little tirades here on opposites, opposition and competition, um, but I may return at some point. But meanwhile, if you like what I'm saying, subscribe and like and next time I'm going to be doing some more things with onions, particularly garlic soup, and that will, I hope, make me happy, <laughs> and because it's not smell video, it'll probably make you happy too. Bye for now.